Well, welcome everybody. Glad you're here today as we worship together, declare God's goodness, raise our hallelujah and praise the Lord. And uh, now we're opening the word of God to hear from him today. We're in the series called Shook. You just saw the little intro video. The idea is that in our lives, many of us are living in relationships that are strained, um, broken off, where we're just constantly at each other. And many times, man, that turns into a major wedge or major wall that keeps us separated from each other. Have y'all experienced that? Are you experiencing that? can be little bitty things with a lot of people, can be big things with just a few people, but that we live in a day and age where we are offended or we are angered at or broken off at one another. So we're talking about how do we deal with that? Now, we live in a day and time where everybody seems to be offended by something. It's come to a point now where we realize that and are making our own jokes about it, right? I've, I found a couple of memes. Only a few of them could actually show in church, but a couple of memes about that. One is a guy who just says, look, I'm pretty busy today, so if you could just go ahead and offend yourself, we'll save each other some time, right? Because I know I'll get around to it, but if you'll just go ahead and do it, it can happen. Many of us get our feelings hurt and we want to tell somebody. We're like a little baby, right? You post offended me, I'm going to report you. And we whine and complain. Hey, how about just, uh, you know, don't go back to that website or quit following that person. How about that? Even this, man, this guy right here expresses, if my post offended you, pray for me because I thought it was funny. Now I think that's good. And we're going to talk in a couple of weeks about, hey, should we ever offend anybody? Do Christians ever offend? And if so, when's the right time to offend? We'll talk about that in the coming weeks. But right now, we're going to talk about just the idea of, hey, what if I'm the one who's been offended? How do I deal with that? What do I do with that? Now, last week, we learned a little bit about offense, right? We learned the definition. Of, we, we learned that there are plenty of opportunities to be offended. Luke 17, 1, Jesus said, it's inevitable that offense is going to come. It's going to happen that people are going to do things to, to you or to hurt you or say things that wound you. It's inevitable that it's going to come. We defined what an offense was. Now, in our culture, it means you hurt me, you made me mad, you upset me, you disagreed with me, something like that. But we kind of traced back the etymology of the word, remember, if you were here last week, that really offense, the idea comes from a Greek word, which means the bait of a trap. That yes, somebody may do something to you, but that becomes bait that if you respond wrongly, you wind up trapped. It actually is considered a stumbling, something that causes you to stumble in your faith, that causes you to not walk by faith anymore. And offense is whenever you step outside of faith and begin to live in your flesh. And though our world may embrace offense and maybe even find some wicked sort of power in offense, what we learned is, is that holding on to offense is not smart that it only leads you to be lonely and isolated, that you play right into the devil's strategy of divide and devour, and that that root of bitterness within you will ruin everything about your life, okay? So that's what we learned last week. People are going to hurt you. If you hold on to that, it can be ruinous to you, so let it go. Now, what we're going to talk about today is the gap between when somebody does something and you actually holding on to an offense, and that is, how do you keep from getting offended in the first place? If I hold on to it, it's really, really bad, but how can I keep from being offended in relationships, listen, where offense is going to happen every day? Your parents, your kids, your, your, your spouse, your friends, your coworkers, fellow students, it's going to happen. How can you keep from being offended? Okay, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Proverbs right in the middle of the Bible. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 19. We're really going to focus on one verse today from Proverbs. We'll see a lot of other scripture uh, from Old and New Testament as we go through the message, but we're honing in on this one verse, Proverbs 19, 11, where God doesn't just say to you, hey, I don't want you to get offended he actually is going to teach us how. And we're going to see a three-step process to keep, you, to keep you from becoming offended. Okay, Proverbs 19, 11, here's what the scripture says. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Oh, you see that? 
A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. It's his glory to overlook a transgression. I want to read it to you, show it to you in several different translations so that you can see some nuanced changes. It'll be the same exact meaning, but some nuanced changes. Okay, the Holman Christian Standard Translation says a person's insight, right? Instead of discretion, it's insight gives him patience and his virtue is to overlook an offense. Okay, same idea, different words used. English Standard Version, maybe some of you read that. Good sense makes one slow to anger and it's his glory to overlook an offense. Okay, one last translation. The Amplified Bible says it this way. Good sense makes a man restrain his anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression or an offense. Now, I wanted to show you several different translations of that Hebrew verse so that you kind of get a, an understanding of what we're talking about. God wants you to keep from being offended, and he tells you how to do it. And here's where it starts. Here's step one. Get and use good sense. Do you see that? Good sense makes a man restrain his anger, and that's the first step in this process of overlooking an offense. Do you all see that? Just nod your head. Everybody, every campus, nod your head if you all can see that. That lets me know four of y'all are watching and, and, and are engaged right now. Good sense. you got to have good sense. We, sometimes we will say about a person, man, that boy ain't even got good sense. Is that a good thing or a bad thing when you say that boy ain't even got good sense? That's a bad thing, isn't it? We say, man, he, he needs to get some sense. This idea of good sense, it was translated in different uh, versions of the Bible as discretion or insight. It can also mean prudence or wisdom or understanding. It's the idea that, that you can think about what's going on and make a good choice. The theological word book says it's an intellectual knowledge with reason or of the reason, there's this process of thinking through a complex arrangement of thoughts resulting in a wise dealing and a use of good, practical, common sense. The key to starting, keep from being offended, is to don't just go off, but to think about and use good sense. When you have good sense, common sense, you look at a situation for what it really is. Not for the moment, not from your flesh, but spiritually, you can recognize what's going on. I'm hurt in this moment. You've transgressed me. You've offended me. But I'm going to think about this because if I hold on to this, right, it's going to lead me nowhere good. I'm going to be isolated and alone. I'm going to be divided and devoured with the people that I love, and it's going to ruin everything about me. I'm using good sense. Now, please hear me. To, to use discretion, to use good sense, doesn't mean that you ignore your feelings. You really do feel hurt. Somebody really said something mean. They really did something awful. You're not ignoring your feelings. What you're doing is you're choosing to subjugate your feelings to clear thinking. Are y'all with me? That if you want to keep from, if you want your marriage to get better, you got to quit popping off with whatever the first thing that comes out of your mouth whenever something happens, and you got to start saying, God, would you set a guard over my mouth and let me see this for what this really is, okay? If you want things to get better with your friends or coworkers, then you got to stop just doing what comes naturally and begin to say to God, I need to have good sense. I need to see this thing clearly and for what it is so that I won't act foolishly and become offended. Dolly Parton said, I am not offended by all the dumb blonde jokes because she said I'm not dumb and I'm also not blonde, which is probably true. <laughs> so if you're not dumb or blonde, why would you be offended by a dumb blonde joke? You would not be. That's the idea of discretion. That if somebody's saying something, if I think through this thing, I can have a rational thought that says, I'm going to choose not to be offended. Sometimes whenever things are happening and you're at home and somebody's getting a little snippy or you do something innocently and somebody's at your, up in your business and, and on you, sometimes that discretion, and again, we're, we're, this is learning to live spiritually, not in your flesh. To learn to say, God, help me, show me what's going on, not just doing what I feel in a moment. Sometimes whenever things get a little bit chippy, 
you can honestly say, you know what? It's really not me. I didn't mean or, or, or do anything. All I did was sneeze. Okay? You can honestly say, I think maybe this other person is the problem. Now, 99% of the time, they're the problem anyway, right? But, but sometimes clearly thinking, you can see, you know what? The deal is, it's not that I'm bad or in the wrong. The truth is they're stressed, they're tired, they're, they're, they're feeling under the pressure right now. Come on, do y'all ever see that at your house? Y'all ever see it? You know you do. But if you don't acknowledge that, you'll just get broke off and mad. Not acknowledging, you know what? They're just, right now, it's just not a good time for them. And when you can recognize that, it can keep you from being offended. Sometimes you can recognize it's not just a moment, that, but that it's wounded people who wound people. It's hurting people who hurt people. And so, listen, if you're paying attention to the Spirit of God and seeing people past what they just said, did, or posted, maybe the Spirit would reveal to you that really they're doing that because they're hurting. So you can take the... Uh, emphasis off of what you feel and begin to see them for how they really are. You know what? They're just not in a good place right now. And whenever you find yourself seeing that, you know what? They're not in a good place right now. Even if you don't fully understand it, you can do what my friend Chip Judd says. You can choose in a moment to say, you know what? I choose to believe they're probably doing the best they can with what they have. That if you were in their same situation, you'd probably be twice as bad as them right now. So I'm choosing to have a little bit of grace for that. Now, can I just kind of parenthetically say this, okay? And it's even in brackets, even in my notes. That if you find yourself serially offended by the same person, if you find yourself serially offended by the same person, then I think it is wise for you to create some distance between you and that person. It may be as simple as turn the TV off. It may be as simple as mute them, unfollow them, unfriend them. Just don't go on that part of social media anymore if you find yourself constantly offended or even looking for offense. Just don't do it. Jesus said... If there is a part of you that causes you to stumble, same word, offends you, right? It's an opportunity for you to get trapped and to get outside of faith. If you have a part of your body that causes you to stumble, pluck it out or cut it off. He wants you to take extreme measures so that you would walk in holiness and righteousness. I think what's true of eyes and hands can also be true of people. That if there are people who are serially wrong for you and they bring out your worst, I think you would be wise to do what God's word says, and that is don't let them be your best friends and don't keep putting yourself in that place of being wounded and hurt over and over again. I have a verse for that, Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Okay? So sometimes discernment will go, you know what? I'm not going to take offense because they're having a bad day. They're, they're just not in a good place. But sometimes your discretion will help you realize the problem is me. I'm not in a good place. I'm not having a great day. I'm pressured at work. It's, I'm a CPA and it's almost April the 15th or it's almost a quarterly deadline. And, and you know you're under it. You can feel stress. You can feel pressure. You may feel all kinds of negative things going on around you. You may be hormonal or whatever. And so you recognize the problem's not them. The problem's me. When I find that I am not in a good place and I'm a, I've become toxic, that's not a good time for me to say to anybody in my family, hey, I want to talk to you about something. Right? That's not a good time for you to, go to say, hey, I've been meaning to talk to you. That's just, that is never going to end well. Does that ever end well for y'all? I got a feeling it goes about like it does for me. I'm set off already. I'm not really wanting to talk. I'm wanting to vent. And that just typically leads to offense, okay? So discretion, if you're going to keep from being offended and offending 
then you've got to use some discretion and say, you know what, God, help me to see what's really going on here. Now, the truth is, not everybody has good sense. Am I telling the truth? Come on, y'all know anybody? Don't point at them. But you know anybody ain't got good sense, right? There are sometimes you just look at each other and you go, what in the world are you thinking? And most of the time, he's thinking nothing, right? It's, it's just, <laughs> that's the problem. He ain't got good sense. So if, if you're sitting here thinking, Chip, I wouldn't even know where to begin to get good sense. Can I tell you where you ought to start? Here's where the beginning of this kind of discernment and wisdom and understanding starts. All right? I'm going to give you three things. The fear of the Lord, the word of the Lord, and the request of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do His commandments, His praise endures forever. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you really want to begin to have a discernment about you, if you want to be able to see things spiritually, you got to have the Spirit of God in you. And that begins with the fear of the Lord. It starts with, God, I'm scared of you. You're right, I'm wrong. But it moves to an awe of God, that God, not only are you right, but you're righteous and you're just and you're kind and you're good. And I stand in awe of you. And even that fear ultimately gives way to love because the Bible says in the New Testament, perfect love casts out fear. And the more you get to know God, the more you realize He is all loving and all kind and all good and all right and His way is best. And so if you want discretion, if you want wisdom to know how to deal with your kids or your friends or your coworkers, God, I want to fear you. I want to live my life your way, the fear of the Lord, the word of the Lord. Wisdom comes from the word of the Lord. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. Do you see that? That you don't have to have a great education. You don't even have to have a great IQ. You can be wiser than your teachers, be more educated than your teachers, the Bible says, simply by giving yourself to the Word of God. One of the wisest men I've ever met in my life was a guy named Mr. R.B. Hutcherson. Years ago in Brookhaven, Mississippi, Mr. R.B. stood about four feet tall, and he had a fourth grade education. He had air, hair coming out his nose and ears, looked like a wizard off of some Harry Potter show. But he would put his little crooked, crooked finger up in my face and could quote the Bible coming and going. And though the man had very little education, he was one of the wisest men I know because the word of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord is sure it makes wise the simple. When you read the word of God, God begins to enlighten you as to what's going on happens all the time. You ought to be reading the Word of God. It's a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Yesterday, I was reading in, in the book of 2 Kings in chapter 5 about a guy named Naaman. And Naaman was a very powerful military man, very wealthy. He was an Aramean, and yet he had leprosy. He had a problem. And a servant in his house said, hey, listen, what you need to do is you need to go to Israel. There's a man of God there. He could heal that leprosy in, in God's name. And so Naaman goes and he has a, a big uh, posse of people going with him, a lot of stuff that he's going to give to the man of God. But if you've read this story, you know he comes to Elisha's house and Elisha offends him. He doesn't mean to, but he offends him. He doesn't even go out to see him. He just tells him, go bathe in the Jordan River seven times and your, your flesh will be as, like a baby. And Naaman is ticked. And all of his guys say to him, why would you not just do what the man says? And Naaman says, because he didn't do what I expected him to do. I got better rivers than the one he's telling me to go bathe in where I came from. And in that moment, because I'm living in the midst of a marriage and kids and in-laws and, and co-workers and a community too, I know how easy it is for me to be offended. God just showed me, you know what, Chip? You get offended when people because you're just like Naaman. When people don't meet your expectations, like, ooh, God, you didn't even have to tell me that. You know what, Chip, you're just like him because your pride gets wounded because you think you got better ways. The testimony of the Lord is sure it can make wise even a simple person who doesn't have a whole lot of sense. But man, the word of God, day by day, I'm telling you, he wants to help you in that same way to lower expectations. God, let me just be a humble person then today, Jesus, with zero expectation. 
God, I want to do that. It'll keep you from getting your defenses up and being offended. So the fear of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the request of the Lord. James 1 verse 5 says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Do you see that? If you want wisdom, how do you get it? Ask God. The, the man who was the wisest man ever in history, who wrote the book of Proverbs that we're in today, his name's Solomon. Solomon was wise, wise, wise. How did he get so wise? Some of y'all know. Because one night, he was having a dream. God appeared to him and said, Solomon, you can ask me for anything you want. And Solomon said, God, I don't know how to live this life you've placed me in. Would you please give me wisdom? And God said, I can do that. Because I give to all men generously. You see it? So if you need good sense... Say, God, I want to learn to walk in your way. I want to fear you and give my life to you. I want your word to be my lamp to my feet and the light to my path. And I'm saying to you, God, would you give me wisdom and discernment? Okay, Get and use good sense. Here's step two. Be slow to anger. Be slow to anger. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool lose, always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. And what we're learning is we want to be wise, so we want to hold back our temper. Proverbs 19, 11, our verse for today, A man's discretion makes him slow to anger. That word, that, that phrase, makes him, it's causative, which means this, that whenever you have discretion, that discretion will have an effect. You tracking with that? This is what the Bible's saying. That a man's discretion, when you start to see things from God's perspective, thinking clearly about things like God says, then that will cause you to have a slowdown in your knee-jerk reaction and response. You watching that? Step one, get some discretion, because discretion is going to make you become slow to anger. That idea of slow to anger right there literally means it takes you a long time to blow your lid. It takes you a long time. It, the, the Hebrew phraseology actually is you have a long nose. Now that's kind of weird, isn't it? You have a long nose. That's what it says. Literally, you, that, that it would make you have a long nose. We think having a long nose means you're a liar, right? Pinocchio. But in Hebrew culture, having a long nose was actually a characteristic of God. When he revealed himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed. Here's who God says he is. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. He's slow to anger. That phrase is the same one in the scripture we're looking at. God has, he revealed himself as having a long nose. They thought when you got mad, it showed up in your face. Does that happen? You bet it happens. Man, some dudes turn in red face, nostrils flare out, back up. First time I ever saw that, I was in the fourth grade. Moved to Columbus, Mississippi, met Robert Patterson. Robert was twice my size, and we could all kind of pick on him a little bit because we could outrun him, but if Pootie ever got real mad, that's what we called him, Pooty. That was his nickname. He ain't offended by that, I hope. If you are, forgive me, Robert. Right? But if he ever turned, his face turned red and his nostrils flared, dude, run. Just start running because he was mad. God has a long nose. God's, God's default mode is kind, gracious, love, and kind. It takes him a long time to blow his top. But if you don't think he can, turn to Psalm 18 sometime and read. God can, God can bring his wrath, but it takes him a long time. And so what we're learning in this scripture is, is that you want to be wise and not have a short fuse because a short fuse is going to cause you to hurt people. Sometimes when you didn't even need to hurt them. Have y'all ever taken something the wrong way? And you blew up and went off and you gave somebody an earful or an eyeful. And then you realize, oh, snap, <laughs> I took that the wrong way. And then you try to justify it like you took it the right way and you're right still. Just quit. <laughs> That's our nature. But God says quit. Only a 
fool gives full vent to his anger. A fool does that. We're learning to be wise. We're learning to live counterculture up in here today. That we're going to say, God, I want to have patience. I want to have a long nose. I don't want to have a short fuse. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to miss, God, what you have for me. I don't want to miss it. There's a scripture in the New Testament, in the book of James, where God's word talks about being slow to anger. James chapter 1 verse 19 says this, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to, uh, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now I want you to see what it says. Please see what it says. The Bible doesn't say never get angry. It just says be slow to get angry. Right? Because, here's the deal, you got you to use some discernment, step one, to see things spiritually so that you can know if what I'm feeling right now, is this a personal wound or is this something against God? Don't miss this. Most of us get offended when somebody hurt us. And the Bible says that's never, that's never a reason to be angry like that. It's not, that's not what God calls us to because somebody was mean to me, somebody hurt my feelings, all those things. Do you think Judas hurt Jesus' feelings? Do you think Peter wounded Jesus when he denied him three times? Do you think that somehow Jesus was, was unaffected by the guy on his right and left on the cross hurling insults at him? In his human side, if he felt all things like we feel things and tempted in all ways, you know that that was an occasion for him to be offended. But Jesus didn't do a thing. Why? Because those were just things happening to him. And he was like, I'm laying that, that down. But did Jesus ever get mad? You bet Jesus got mad. He's the exact representation of God. Took him a long time. He didn't get mad about everything. He gave a lot of grace to a lot of people. But there were some occasions when he got mad. He got mad at people who were supposed to be righteous, laying burdens on innocent people who were just trying to get to God, and yet they just kept loading laws on them. And Jesus called them, you hypocrites. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. You hypocrites. There was a day when Jesus was in the temple And he goes to flipping the tables. Why? Not because Jesus was mad. They all not listen to my sermon. That's not what that was about. It was about Jesus being ticked because this was supposed to be a place where people got connected to God and they had turned it into a place to make money. Are you tracking with me? That Jesus did get mad and there is a righteous indignation, but we ought to only get angry when God's the one being disrespected or done wrong. And there are occasions in our culture where we ought to be righteously indignant. But 95% of what we get broken off at is, you hurt my feelings. You didn't respond like I wanted you to. You were mean to me. Got you tracking? Discretion will make you slow to anger. Now, I'm talking to some people here that I know, I know, I know, that for you, anger has been the battle of your life. And you've tried not to get mad, but you just, you just can't control your anger. And so can I just speak a word to you, just, just very briefly. If you are one and you're here today and you're saying, Chip, I don't know how to not lose it, dude. I mean, I I don't know if it comes from my family. My dad did this. My mom did this. My my grandparents did this. I I was born Irish. I I, I don't know. I mean, people say that. I was just born Irish. That's just the way we are. If you were born with a predisposition toward anger and venting in a violently angry way, here's my recommendation to you. Be born again. Okay? All, All of us are born with certain tendencies, proclivities, leanings, and Jesus' answer is, be born again. John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Maybe the reason you can't find victory over your madness is because you've never truly experienced being born again, where you say, Jesus, I'm a mess. Forgive me. I die to that. Come into my life and change me.
Okay? Be born again. Second of all, stop living by your flesh and start surrendering to the Spirit on a day-by-day basis. Stop doing it on your own and start asking the Spirit of God to help you. Galatians 5 says there's this battle that goes on. Galatians 5, 17. Spirit and flesh are warring against one another. And here's how you know when you're living by the flesh, which means you without God. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. That's usually where we focus on. But I want you to see, these are also the deeds of the flesh. A man or woman without God. Enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, all that. Drunkenness, carousing, things like those of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you see it? That if you're living life under your own strength, according to your own way, you know it because you fight all the time. And you will never experience the kingdom of God doing it your way. The very next verse tells you the answer, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, check that out, love Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And there's no law against that. Everything that's the opposite of anger is right there. Do you see it? Everything that's the opposite of fussing and fighting and offense is right there. And it only comes by the fruit of the Spirit. So that tells me that every day you ought to say, Holy Spirit, fill me up. Do you know that today is Pentecost Sunday? Pentecost Sunday means 50 days after the resurrection, the day the church celebrates the Holy Spirit being poured out on the believers in Acts chapter 2. Today's that day. Today would be a great day for you. Maybe you've never even done this before to say, Holy Spirit, I receive you in my life. Jesus baptized me in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill me up. And then every day from now on, moment by moment, say, Holy Spirit, I need you to help me because If I live in my flesh, I'm going to fuss and fight. But by your spirit, I can be changed. Do you see it? So be born again. Surrender to the spirit. Here's the third thing I would say to you just in passing. You may need to get some help from a friend. Tiger Woods has a swing coach, right? Arguably one of the best golfers in history. And even he needs a coach to help him. Successful businesses bring in consultants and experts to help them get better. Christians ought to strengthen each other. And sometimes you need a brother or sister. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one brother sharpens another. And so if you need somebody just to help you, maybe to develop some tools to help you know how to live this life out, can I encourage you, get a, get a mentor or go see a Christian counselor who can help you. Okay? Get and use good sense. Slow your anger. Here's the third thing. Choose to take a pass on a fence. Choose to take a pass on a fence. Make the choice to just pass over it. Proverbs 19, 11, A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Right? Transgression's going to come. You're going to get hurt. Can we all agree with that? Somebody's going to say something to you before you get out of the parking lot today. Come on, don't act like it doesn't happen. I know. Y'all in the parking lot. (laughs) Right? It happens. It happens. And if you're not doing it on the outside, on the inside you are. Just as bad. Just as bad. Right? Somebody's not going to go. Somebody's not going to do right. You're going to get, somebody's not going to pick the right place to go to lunch. A transgression is going to happen. And here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to overlook it. That word, listen, that you, don't, you don't ever receive offense, you take offense. Right? It's something you choose to do. People do stuff, but you don't receive offense, you have to take that offense. And so what this scripture says is you're going to choose to overlook it. That Hebrew word overlook means you're going to choose to pass by. You're going to choose to let it go. You're not going to dwell on it. You're not going to massage it around in your mind. You're not going to talk to your mom about it. You're not going to talk to your daddy. You're not going to text your friends. I cannot believe. You're you're not going to dwell on it. You're going to choose to say, I'm going to let this thing slide right on by me. Okay? Look, I'm about to change it. This is going to change your marriage right here. You're going to start choosing to not 
take offense. You're going to choose to pass. Sometimes people offer you bread for lunch. Would you like some bread? No, I'll pass. <laughs> right? You got, a, you got a different goal in mind, right? I'll pass. Right now, I have two of my kids who want to go skydiving. And for the life of me, I don't understand why you would jump out of a perfectly good airplane. And I ain't paying for them to do it either. I'll be on the ground waiting whenever they get there. I'll buy them lunch. But I'm not going to subsidize their delinquency. What in the world would cause them to... I'll pass. Okay, y'all feel me? Anybody here feel me? I'm passing on that. Too many bad things can go wrong. That's a downside of getting old. You know everything that could go wrong on the way down, right? I'll pass. I'm making a conscious choice to go past it. When you have a transgression, the word says, I'm choosing to take a pass. I'm choosing to let it keep on going. I'm going to keep on walking. I'm not going to let it be an issue. I'm not going to let something outside of me exercise power over me. Listen, you can be offended or you can be free, but you can't be both. You can choose to be offended or you can be free, but you cannot do both at the same time. To overlook doesn't pretend that it doesn't happen. To overlook simply means knowing what just happened, I'm going to take a pass on retaliation because I've got something better in mind. It won't be smart for me. It's not going to help me. It's not going to encourage this. I'll pass. Now, when you take a pass, check this, when you take a pass, it is to his glory. Do you see that? It's your glory. This is, it's called your adornment. This is the way you look good. This is the way that you get respect. This is the way you go up in people's minds. Now, this is totally opposite of your flesh. It's totally opposite of what our culture teaches us, even from a little child. That if somebody hurts you, the way to look good, bro, is to bow up and smoke somebody. All right, come on, fellas, can we agree with that? That that somehow our manhood is measured by whether or not we would fight. Even if you're going to get beat down, you are not going to get disrespected. And so our culture says, if you want to look good and be thought highly of, Fight, throw, go. But can I just say to you, that is short-sighted, immature, and unspiritual. As you age, with a little bit of discernment, you realize that many times it takes greater strength to forgive somebody and let it pass than it does to say, let's go. It takes greater fortitude to let it go. Come on. If you saw an 80-year-old man out in the parking lot, Jump out of his car. Come on, man. Let's go. You would go, oh, Lord, have mercy. What is going on with this dude, right? You you would really want to call the authorities to help him bless his heart. You see some 78-year-old lady in Walmart parking lot. She's taking her false teeth out. She's ready to go, right? Let's let's go. You're like, woman, I am so sorry. You don't go, oh, my gosh, he is the man. Your heart breaks for them. I'm saying to you, from from the spirit perspective, strength, what makes you look good is not your ability to line them up. It's not your ability to say, let's go then. It's not your ability to put your husband or your son or your daughter or your wife in their place. That's not what means that you have strength. What the scripture says is you never look better than when you choose from a place of fortitude, good thinking, reserved anger, say, I'm going to choose to take a pass. That's when, as we age and as we really begin to understand what time it is, that's when you look at a dude and go, man, that guy has to be unbelievably strong to do what he just did. Am I telling the truth? I don't see how she does it. I don't see how she does it. Man, just so gracious, so kind all the way through. If there was ever a guy who modeled for us this idea of 
our glory being our willingness to overlook an offense. I, I think about a guy in the Old Testament named Joseph. Maybe, maybe you know Joseph, maybe you know his story. When he was a little kid, he was like most, most little kids, he's just immature, he's a little punkish, and so he would let his mouth say things he shouldn't say, but because of that, his older brothers, who should have known better, took offense at him. And they responded with jealousy and anger and abuse. And one day they saw Joseph coming to meet them, and they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They weren't where they were supposed to be, and they knew they were in trouble. So you know what they did? They concocted a plan to finally be through with this little brat once and for all. They were going to kill him. Only the oldest brother talked him out of it. So instead, they just beat him down to a pulp, took his coat and tore it all to pieces and with his own blood on it, took it back to his dad and said, I guess a wild beast ate him. But the truth is, they sold him as a slave to some gypsies saying, good riddance. You think Joseph had an opportunity to be offended by that? Got to Egypt, just minding his own business, landed a job, doing his best, and the boss's wife has the hots for him. And he says, girl, there ain't no way. And she accuses him falsely of a crime that he did not commit, and he's thrown into the pit, into the dungeon. Do you think he had an opportunity to say, In the prison, he just, he's just being faithful. He's just doing his thing, and he gets elevated. And, and these two guys, the king's baker and the king's cupbearer, come in, and they have dreams. And Joseph, by God's grace, interprets the dream, and they come true. And he says to the one guy, please, 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 just don't forget me. And guess what? He forgets him. And I can just feel Joseph's heart over and over again saying, what did I do? What have I done to deserve this? And he had every right and reason to become offended and just mad and be broken off at everybody. But somehow, he chose not to. Y'all know the story, right? He eventually interprets Pharaoh's dream and becomes the vice president of Egypt, which means, let me tell you what that means, which means he can, he can kill the cupbearer. He can do whatever he wants to do. He could go take Miss Potiphar... And throw her in the dungeon. You falsely accuse me, it's coming to you. You finna get yours now. When his brothers show up in need, they don't know him, but oh my gosh, he hadn't forgot them, has he? And so he tests them to see if their hearts are truly broken and repentant. And when they are, he forgives them completely. And one day when their father has died and they think he's going to take revenge on them, Joseph says this to them in Genesis chapter 50. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in God's place? See, it's God's job to deal with the person who's hurt you. Am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. You did hurt me. You meant to hurt me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people. Do you, do you see that Joseph, with discernment, says, God, I am trusting you with the pain. I'm trusting you with the people who perpetrated the pain. And I, God, I've learned to trust you with my present and the future. And God, you've been up to something that the world doesn't understand, but God, I don't want to miss it. And so because of that, God, because I've got discernment and I can see it, I'm going to choose not to act in anger. I'm going to choose to overlook the trespass. And I would say to you, because Joseph chose to overlook the trespass, which took a lot of strength, we sit back now and say, that was an unbelievable dude. If he had killed them all, we would not celebrate him but because he chose instead the way of God's grace and righteousness, we say, that man is unbelievable. And he's remembered. He's remembered. And so God is saying to us today, listen, he wants to change your life. He wants to change your daily life and living. And he says, I want to do it by you welcoming me into your life to begin to live my way by my spirit and to choose to live in grace. Come on, across every campus right now, can we just pray together? 
Do you have in mind that person that gets on your last nerve the quickest? I'm, I'm not an idiot. I know that sometimes you can sit beside somebody in church and you don't like them at all right now. Y'all fought the whole way. You've been fighting the whole weekend. Maybe you've been fighting for months or years. And can I just ask you, is that from Jesus or is that from the enemy? Is that righteous anger? Or is that personal anger? And I know, I know, I know. I don't understand. I don't get it. But it's not really about me. This is about you right now saying, God, what in the world do you want to do in my life? What is it that you're wanting to do in me? It starts with the fear of the Lord. God, I want to live your way. God, I want your word to begin to be my lamp and my light. Would you help me? Would you give me wisdom? Maybe you need to be born again. Maybe you need to see Holy Spirit fill me, cleanse me, wash me, baptize me again, Jesus, in your presence. Maybe God's leading you to get help. But would you just ask him right now? And would you determine in your heart that you want to live with the inner fortitude to not let other people control you, but you're going to choose to take a pass in the parking lot in a minute, in your seat right now, later on today when your parents are maybe sideways, would you just give the Holy Spirit permission to whisper into your ear? I mean, I literally want you to do this. Would you give the Holy Spirit right now permission to whisper into my ear, take a pass, take a pass, Take a pass. Take a pass. Just a second. I'm going to end this prayer time. We're all going to stand up. We're going to worship the Lord together. While we're doing that, there are going to be men and women around the room who would love to help you. If you need to give your life to Christ, if you want to come and pray about a relationship or your own heart, listen, it may be just something else you got going on this week, and you just need God to hear a prayer. You have not because you ask not. When we stand up and sing, would you come today and would you let the kingdom of God invade your life, invite him in to have his way. Father, we love you, we bless you. Come have your way as we worship and praise and are set free. We honor you in Jesus' name, amen.